Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, in the last few decades, um, we've known that the way that the body is represented in the brain can be um, variable in accordance to experience. It is, it's experience dependent. And that's true for multisensory body representations, for example, in the parietal cortex, uh, where we use uh, those representations for goal-directed movement or uh, action planning. But it's also true for unimodal cortices, that is, primary cortices, S1 and M1. And a good example of that that's really, really known is that professional string musicians have an increased representation of the digits in S1 and M1. And in a recent study that was done with dyslexics, those that are born without their upper limbs, um, they show increased activation or increased recruitment of the primary cortex when they move their foot. Um, but also they, see, they, they show uh, increased activation in parietal cortices. So these can be considered as individual sensory motor experiences, and I would even say atypical sensory motor experiences. Now, um, consider this case, the case of congenital blindness, so those who have never seen their own body. And if you work with congenitally blind, um, you notice that they move differently in the world. They interact differently with the objects around them, they rely on their hands for um, spatial tasks, and we wanted to ask, um, at least in this talk, so how would this experience, this lifelong visual deprivation, um, change the body representation in primary cortices, that is in S1 and M1, but also in converging cortices, multimodal representations, in, for example, in the parietal areas, but also in the premotor areas. In this study, we have um, eight congenitally blind. They're all um, retinally, retinally blind um, and nine healthy subjects. And we ask them to move their entire body, 12 different body parts unilaterally, um, and they do this and they do this following an auditory cue. So they say they hear right hand, and then they move their right hand, and so on and so forth. They do this 18, 18 times, and we specifically use active movements because we already know from former experience and also from former studies that when you do active movements, you see a full recruitment of both S1 and M1. Great, so let's start with our first study goal, which was uh, the plasticity and the, topo the topography in primary sensory motor cortices. And to do that, we'll look at single subject maps using the population receptive field model, which is really, really common in um, visual neuroscience. But what we do here is that we adopt it to um, looking at the body representation. So instead of modeling the visual field, we map the field, which is our body. <coughs> And if we look at the individual maps, so you have on your left a sighted map of a sighted subject, on your right a blind subject, you can see the central sulcus going from the uh, dorsal to the, vent uh, to the ventral parts, um, and then you can see the entire, I'm, I'm just showing you the, the right hemisphere, but we get the same result for the left, left hemisphere, and you can see the entire representation of the body, color-coded. And here, we, again, we don't, we don't really see any kind of differences in terms of the topography. And we can show you another example. Wait, does this keep closing? Right, again, a sighted individual on the left, a blind individual on the right. We can't see any kind of differences in the individual maps, at least as far as the topography goes. And then we can look at the group level. We don't do that on native spaces we did before, but we do this on an FS average brain, a free surfer average brain. And we can look at cross-correlation analysis, which is also very common in topography. And on the group level, again, and you see the central sulcus, we don't see any kind of differences, at least not by looking at it. So that part, so far, we don't see any kind of differences in the topography. Um, and it could be that what we're looking at is not the right thing. We should be looking not at the topography, but rather at the size, the resolution in each voxel, which we'll talk about later. So then we move into multimodal areas. And here I'm going to look at two very common areas. One, um, here I'm going to call it the posterior parietal cortex, but you, it's variable, the name that people use. Some use as superior parietal lobule, anterior superior parietal lobule. Um, and it's really known to be involved in the body schema, so our representation of our body in space and the way we use it to interact with the external space. And I'm going to look at the premotor ventral cortex. And um, importantly, both of these are functionally connected. You usually see um, 
um, activity in one and then activity in the other, and they also are functionally connected in resting state experiments. And also, importantly, they both receive visual information and proprioceptive information. And there's a summation effect, typically. That is, if you get, uh, if you do, let's say, visual reach, and then you do visual reach, uh, you do non-visual reach, the visual reach will have higher activity. Okay, so the problem with this area, many times, is to find a good localizer for them, because each individual, there's a lot of um, uh, differences and variability between subjects and between studies, and also there's um, a, lot in, a lot of variability with the actual task. So what we're gonna do here is use an atlas that was proposed a couple years ago in Nature um, that is based on the Human Conic Tongue Project, and it delineates 180 different areas in each cortex. And what's great about this is that we can look in each area and we can decide about it based both on the anatomy of a lot of subjects, but also about functional tasks. So in this case, functional connectivity. And then we decide on the um, posterior parietal cortex, and then we're gonna look at the effect of both of the hands and both of the legs, specifically because these areas are, tend to be more bilateral. And if we look between the groups, and you can see the beta values, and then the blind group, and the sighted group, and we do a random effects analysis, and we get a big, big difference between the blind group and the sighted groups when they move their hands. But no difference, not a significant difference, at least in the legs and the faces. And um, correctly, so last time I showed this, Udi said, so what goes on, maybe could this be explained just by muscle tone? Right, or by what's the activity in M1 and S1. So we can use, again, the same map, the atlas, to look at S1 and M1 that was already defined, and then mask our activity map, our peak activity, for each effector, only for the primary cortices, and we can look at the peak value, both for the sighted group and the blind group, and we don't see any difference. Um, even if anything, there's a slight higher activity for the sighted. So the activity in M1 and S1 doesn't explain the activity we see in the posterior parietal cortex. And this gives us um, maybe a clue into what is going on there. And maybe there is some form of a compensatory mechanism that, um, um, that creates a task maintenance, in a sense, for the blind when they use their hands. So because they have no visual inputs in that area, they have to rely much more on proprioception. So after we did this, we can go further and look at the uh, premotor ventral, um, and this is very, very well defined in the map. Um, and when we look at premotor ventral, we get a different result. We actually see almost an opposite result. Uh, we see no activation at all, uh, neither for the hands or the legs in the blind group, but we see a typical activation um, for the legs and the hands in the sighted group. Um, and so, this makes us think of, so we do know it, it should be, oh, and it's important to say, of course, that this also cannot be explained neither by the activity, um, as I showed before, of the hands, and also cannot be explained by the activity of the legs in S1 and M1. And, and we do know that the ventral premotor is much more visually oriented than the uh, posterior parietal cortex, but it doesn't explain this result. So if there is no, visual inputs, why would there be a suppression of proprioceptive inputs? And I think um, this goes into a, a, a bigger question, because usually what we do when we study congenitally blind is that we look at what goes on in the deprived visual cortex. And in the deprived visual cortex, we uh, look at two competing principles. One is task maintenance, so these functional areas continue to do what they did before. Or we look at task switching. And in this case, um, I'm thinking about looking at the same kind of ideas, but instead of looking at what goes on in the visual cortex, we look outside of the visual cortex in areas that tend to rely on visual inputs. Um, and of course, we do see, though, that there, it could be that the, there is some compensation mechanism going on, and this uh, invites further investigation into um, the um, proprioception at all um, in the congenital divide, so perhaps maybe they will be better in doing proprioceptive tasks. Um, and importantly, so we, we didn't see any differences in the topography, but that's only half of the picture, as I said, because when we use the population receptive field me method, instead of looking only at the location of the receptive field, we can also look at the size of the receptive field. So 
bigger size receptor field means that it responds to more effectors, that means it has less resolution. Now, we, I'm almost finishing that analysis, but, that analysis, but what I want to do is I'm looking at the activation, or basically all the topography of each effector in S1 and M1, and then I look at the receptor, receptor, receptor field sizes in those areas, and then we can do a second level analysis and look if there are differences between the sighted and the blind. Um, and, of course, we didn't discuss at all what goes on in the uh, deprived visual cortex, which is a missing link here because um, typically people discuss, or the literature discuss, the PPC, the, the ventral premotor, and also EBA. So um, if you want to learn more about what goes on in the uh, um, lateral occipital temporal cortex, the EBA specifically, um, I'll be in OHBM. Um, I'll be presenting on my poster at the last day under the, I think, visuomotor functions category. So I'd love to see you there. Um, thank, I want to thank my lab members, and I also want to thank, in this opportunity, the ENU staff, not only for um, organizing this day, but for helping us throughout the year to do science. Thank you.